part of the launch of an anecdote at Archive of Exhibition Lives and the public beginning of a new project that is around the unarchivable. Um, and exactly at this point, I am very, very happy to have the chance <laughs> to speak with you, Lynn Ballard Bad Hellbrock. Um, thanks for coming here and joining this endeavor. Lynn Han Ballard Bad Hellbrock is a researcher and curator, and um, I think you are, uh, I mean, a very important backbone of Savi Contemporary, which is a project in Berlin that, I mean, in Austria you say, you sh if it wouldn't exist, it should be invented, but I would not know who would invent it if not Bonaventure Hindi Kung, who actually invented it already as Savi Contemporary in Berlin, um, a place that brings together knowledges, as we learned from him, you know, is, it, it makes it totally clear that this can only exist as a plural word, word, with exhibitions, with an archive, as a place of encounter, as a place where many people, whenever they come, feel some kind of home as a place with a strong sense of solidarity, a son strong sense of thinking together with a, in somehow, counter-universalist, universalist perspective from an African knowledge. It's, I think it's just a fantastic place and without Lynn Han, it would not be what it is. <laughs> so um, you are there and uh, you do many things and um, as part of them, you are also doing the Colonial Neighbors Archive, which is a project that you will also talk about today. And um, I'm very much looking forward to that and to discuss it later in relation to what we have done, but especially to what we don't know yet, but what we are looking forward to discuss, which is the unarchivable. So thanks, Lynn for coming. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you very much, Nora. Uh, thank you also for Irid and everyone who is here involved in BAC. It's an absolute pleasure to be sharing space with you today. So as Nora already mentioned, I work in an art um, community space in Berlin. We have various um, archival projects and formats, I would say. One is uh, the Savidoc, which was which is an, um, a library documentation center. Uh, another thing is the United Screens, where we focus more on film. Other things are sonic formats, like uh, our listening sessions, or also the production of vinyls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe we start with the first slide, where we. So uh, basically, I uh, want to kind of bring you into the realm of uh, what kind of memories are um, stored in which containers, on which formats, in order to translate these very fragile constructs of memories that we share or that are very fragmented, with our, fragmented within us. And so it's translating memory into contemporary futures and imagined futures as, uh, for example, Larry also mentioned uh, in the presentation before, like the fictional space as being a space where we can imagine ourselves also in different formats. Um, next. Next slide, please. So the Colonial Neighbors Archive is an archive that's very schizophrenic from other archival formats as we ha that we have. So we try to undo things that we have in a collection. So it's not... Um, uh, process of accumulating things to also serve a kind of narrative or a fetish, the way we have formats like pornography, science fiction, um, colonial uh, trinkets, so we can basically take these objects and just make a standpoint, but it's uh, about taking objects and the narrative behind the objects in order to create one form or many different forms of collective memory. So basically all these objects are connected to the colonial past of Germany or also in its ex um, extensions. Next slide, please. 
So the project was um, started by Bonaventure Sobeng Dikung, who is also the artistic director of Savi Contemporary. And this album was handed um, very randomly to him, say, uh, someone saying, look, you're from Cameroon, right? I found this album and it says Cameroon, so maybe you, maybe you want to keep it. And this album was um, made in 1919 by a former uh, soldier, a German soldier, who was for a year in Cameroon. And it's, um, it's very naive or very, uh, there, are n there are no negative connotations or notes in the book. So basically he um, dedicated this album to his parents and uh, has photos there from fruit, people, landscapes. But you can clearly see places of violence. So you have uh, Faktoreien, which were companies that ensured um, enforced labor on this extended territories. So you have people who are enchained, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so basically, he thought, okay, this came, this found its way randomly to me. What else is there in the attic, in the cellars, in Berlin? And how can we relate to these objects? And how can we understand our narrative towards this very violent period in time? Next slide, please. So one way, um, one of the many ways how these objects come to us is via an open call. So we have, um, yeah, via social media, we ask people if they have trinkets, memorabilia, songs they want to share or family histories or objects that they want to donate and maybe they want to undo. Then we made this film. We can maybe later, if we have time, see this very short film. And a lot of times people just walk through the space and see this project and then they start thinking. And we have all kinds of objects, but um, some of them, of course, are very toxic in a way that they have uh, racist images. And it's quite, um, there are different ways how people engage with this object. Some people see a can and say, oh, wow, this is beautiful. I remember this from my aunt's place. I would eat chocolate out of it. And some other um, people would say, this is outrageous. Why would you have something that perpetuates this inherent violence? Next uh, slide, please. So the things that we have in the collections are basically uh, stamps, cans, package material, stories, but we also engage with um, street names, songs. Yeah, so it can be material or immaterial. Next, please. Here you see various things. So we have uh, coasters from Austria, from Mormpoi, from uh, for Adelberg, different things, chocolate uh, packaging, uh, games, etc. You see this cube, so we try to see how could we also contain toxic material? How can we shift, give people the opportunity to also like um, turn things and make things invisible and let them be and without having to look at them? And we also invited people to um, actively engage with different forms and formats, how to display these toxic materials. Next, please. So here you have different um, examples like um, the, a tin from a chocolate factory, which was called Sarotti, and they were um, criticized for having this imaginary racist depiction of a so-called moor. And they said, okay, we're going to change it. We, we're having a magician now. But they kept the silhouette that clearly people connected to this persona. And yeah, this was just one of the things that we needed to undo as well. Next, please. So basically, we were thinking about an archive as well as a place of violence and discrimination and selection. So we were facing different formats of, mm, I would say, mm, conventional archival makings, which are mm, very hierarchical. So who can access archives? What is in the archive? What is the hierarchy in it? 
uh, what's on display, what's being accessible to whom as well. And here we wanted to uh, share this quote by Membe. The archive, therefore, is fundamentally a matter of discrimination and of selection, which in the end results in the granting of a privileged status to certain written documents and a refusal of that same status to others, thereby judged unarchivable. The archive is, therefore, not a piece of data, but a status. So we wanted to think about how can we undo this status? And of course, we cannot do this work alone because there are so many different forms of how we need to undo it because different bodies react to different things. So we don't carry the same urgencies. So one way was, for example, we um, kept an overhead in a space and invited people to sketch different archival structures that would work for them or that they could imagine um, they could imagine to have this toxic objects embedded in the form that it's uh, okay for them to engage with them. Uh, next, please. So we were also thinking about uh, when we don't claim that we can do this work alone and we need collaborators, we need people who engage in exchange. We, we were thinking about this very vital um, part of participation and also accessibility. And here we borrowed from Jacques Derrida and I quote, there is no political power without control of the archive, if not memory. Effective democratization can always be measured by essential criterion, the participation in and access to the archive, its constitution and its interpretation. And here we are in this conundrum because we don't want to leave these objects just out there, but we want people to be able to engage with them, to feel them, and uh, this haptic connection to something and to understand it's within my reach to engage with this object and also to undo this object. And maybe I just wanted to add um, the relation from the bodies that donate these objects is uh, very different. So some people say, have it, and I don't want I don't want to be connected to this object. I don't want it in my sight and I don't want to be mentioned anywhere. And some people are really eager to haunt the ghosts within their own family history. And they say, wow, we had this uncle and no one wanted to speak. Okay, great, great uncle that no one wanted to speak about. But I want to understand why did he decide to rather be in this extended territory and didn't want to come back to the family. And some people say, hey, I found this shell in the family and it was silenced, but it's clearly connected to our own family history with also uh, wealth and also, yeah, um, generations that lived in extended territories and maybe are still located there. So one format of participation is that we try to um, engage with young adults School, school classes or um, people who also sign up to workshops because when we say, okay, if uh, the, this part of history is being silenced within politics, education, um, society, then we need to engage within um, yeah, this format. So we try to always bring an art practitioner or an activist thinker, musicians, to also activate the archive and to be activated. And uh, this is, for example, one school that uh, works with design and textiles. So we went from the narrative of the archive and then did this whole transition towards cultural appropriation, production, means of production, and also uh, materiality and textiles. And it was quite beautiful because we also tried to engage with uh, local, I don't know, vendors or yeah, people in the area. And we visited actually a, um, a store, a woman, she's, she sells all kinds of textiles and she was explaining them the different codes of the textiles, where they come from and how they're produced, etc and they themselves produced zines which were exhibited in the school as well. Next uh, slide, please. 
So um, just a side note, Arjuna Padurai is a very, apart from you maybe knowing him from his work, is a very generous um, friend of Savi and he just donated 4,000 books that we can share with everyone who comes to the space. And yeah, just a second of acknowledgement. Um, so we borrowed also from Arjuna Padurai, um, thinking of the archive as a tool and also a site of intervention. Um, and I quote, uh, propose that we need to look at the archive in the spirit of Foucault less as a container of the accidental trace and more as a site of a deliberate project. The archive as deliberate project is based on the recognition that all documentation is a form of intervention and thus the documentation does not simply precede intervention but is the first step since all archives are collections of documents, whether graphic, artifactual, or recorded in other forms, this means that the archive is always a meta-invention. This further means that archives are not only about memory and the trace or record, but about the work of the imagination, about some sort of social project. These projects seem for a while to have become largely bureaucratic instruments in the hands of the state, but today we are once again reminded that the archive is an everyday tool. The archive as an institution is surely a site of memory, but as a tool, it's an instrument for the refinement of desire. Archives viewed as active and interactive tools for the construction of sustainable identities are important vehicles for building the capacity to aspire amongst those groups who need it most. Uh, next slide, please. So one format, how we also said that um, the archive could be activated and how it could also activate other bodies, uh, the fragment series. So in the fragment series, we invite an artist, thinker, politicians um, to engage with the collection in regards to their own artistic practice. And in the first iteration, we had Tito Aderemi Batola, who's um, a Nigerian artist, and she was very shocked about these objects that we collect that strip people of their identity. So she did choose the format of a um, device theater project that was performed twice. So people had to endure the whole scenario twice. And it was quite yeah, interesting how this performance of like um, suffering and understanding, how it had an impact to do it again. Because in some forms uh, at Savi, we say that the, this uh, momentum of overwhelming is very important because how can we even claim to work with objects that are connected to this violent past without even being able to endure a 15 minutes theater piece that, uh, yeah, <laughs> as a racist or uh, disturbing images. Next, please. The second artist we invited was Abri Fouri, a South African uh, artist. Um, we just had a group show at the same time, which was called More, uh, Polish Colonialism. And the starting point was a magazine that's called Morze i Colonialism that was very popular for many years in Poland. And Morze uh, means sea. So it was about this understanding of how Poland could emancipate themselves through the act of colonizing other territories from the Western gaze to be East. So they themselves had this desire to expand to go beyond the sea and um, yeah, historically some of you might know much better than I do, but you know when they lost Danzig they built this massive project to build another port in order to really put this into practice. And Abri Fouri in the first image up there you see this bluish photography that was three meters times uh, one five and it's this image from Cape Town looking out to the sea, meaning that there are other people actually on the other side also looking at the sea, not having the um, urge to come and conquer your extended uh, your lands. 
And the second, the middle image is a distriptic, and this was taken from Gori Island, um, where a lot of people who were then enslaved departed the continent. And the very last image down there is a collection of his own um, archive where he did take pictures of journeys from Lampedusa, no, from, how was it? Yeah, from Lampedusa going out and he was just um, sharing these images of very empty boats as in opposition of this entire narrative that people need to endure. So Abri Fouri, also as a white South African artist, he tried to engage here with his own past and think about you know, different dynamics that he needs to unpack as well. Next one, please. Um, we also work in different formats, meaning that we invite people to also curate series. And this was a project by Mar with Marcio Carvalho, where he thought about uh, monuments and he was based in Lisbon and walked with his four-year-old girl and she asked him who this man is and then he looked at the statue and then thought about it and then he felt so bad having to explain her that he was a mo warmonger because he felt so ashamed to explain to his four-year-old girl why uh, people had the necessity to place yeah uh, murderers in the public space so he said hey let's have a let's have a performance series that speaks to each other from city to city. And so we went to uh, the Bismarck statue that is located in uh, Berlin uh, in the zoo, in the park. And we invited three different artists, Walin Fatih, Christian Tongo, and Natalie Mbabikoro to dismantle, uh, haunt the ghosts and yeah in their performative act. And uh, one detail is that this project was, I think, three or four years ago, I think three years ago, and we were just approached by two artists, Various and Gold, that pack monuments, and they wanted to collaborate. And I thought, the Bismarck statue, we did a series of performances there, I don't know. And then we did do the project, and it was quite interesting to understand how important it is to do this again and again and uh, again because uh, it's not about 50, 60, 70 year old people who tell you it's not, f it's not yours to dismantle this history, it's not yours to change this narrative, but it's 18 year old boys who try to school us and lecture us that he is a, like Bismarck is a hero and it's not, um, Tanzania, it's Deutsch Ostafrika, and they don't care about the new borders. So you clearly feel that there's this right-wing milieu that is not only in the, mm, yeah, within the age group that you would expect people to want to remember this period of time in a very romantic way, but it's young adults who actually engage in right-wing populist ideas. And I think this was the last slide. And I wanted to actually just also end this um, presentation with a quote by Anton Wilhelm Amo, who was a thinker in the 18th century, and who, who said, um, whatever senses lives, and whatever lives is nourished, and whatever lives and is nourished grows. And we need to be very mindful like how to sense things and what, where we um, inhale life into and how this will then grow and in which direction. So that's why I'm very grateful that I don't have to do this work alone, that I'm accompanied by beautiful artists who have, yeah, just very important interventions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for bringing this in the discussion. I think it's a very important work and we need, we need to talk about it. Um, we cannot talk about it, the two of us, as we planned, because we enter now the realm of the unplannable. And as we talked so much before and our bodies needed a break, we are now already in the moment where we open up the discussion for everybody. But again, this was a gift and let's just take it into the common discussion. 
I would ask Iri to join and Larry and maybe when they are here I can start with the first um, question to you and then we immediately open up um, to a common discussion. Yeah, um, it's obvious from what you're doing that um, the, as much the work on the collection of these toxic um, materials as the work of its activation is a political work. And it's clear that you do it in the very middle of a space, savvy contemporary, that is um, in many ways translocal. I mean, you, so many knowledges from many places of the world are there, but with your project, you also situate it in a very concrete context of Berlin today. Yeah. A Berlin in which history is, as you just said, embattled. Um, and interestingly enough, much more embattled or oh, maybe interesting, maybe this is also obvious, much more embattled from the right wing than from neoliberalism, whose way to battle, I would say, is just, just to commodify, to render representation irrelevant and to commodify history, while f a fascist approach would be to turn it into a folkish myth, just, just as you describe with this 18-year-old person. So from this perspective, I think it's interesting to think about what you, um, what you mentioned, to think about the concept of the unarchivable in the quote of Achille Mbembe. He, when he talks about the, the unarchivable in this quote, obviously talks about the exclusions of the archive, of what is judged to be unarchivable. Um, now, I think that the it's that what is um, striking or of course so true in what he's saying is that um, when we relate to what, to an archive like yours or many others, we don't relate to what happened. We relate to what remains, which is a process that goes through many violences. But at the same time, we encounter this unarchivable there just as you encounter it with your practices. And um, this is what, what I think we are interested in, this encountering of the unarchivable as a ghost that relates us, that actually activ potentially activates us in relation to the conflict that is there, that is brought in the world through the violence also. So, um, do you, I, I would just um, maybe ask you to, to relate to this, or maybe to say a few more words about the politicality of your practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, we heard it, it's, it's so obvious. And um, how you see this, this relation to the conflictuality that comes with the unarchivable. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Maybe I wanna start with the ghost that you mentioned. So I think uh, something that's also important, important, I think that it's um, great that we don't have to define what is unarchivable. And I think it's also good to have these gaps because these gaps in the making of an archive, they give us the opportunity and also obligation to have to dig and to have to dig together. And I think um, these gaps are also very important to mention because they are deliberately, I mean, there's invisibility is rendered. So it's just not there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, it, it's also a moment of chance where people who had not the chance to r write their own history, now people can write their ancestors' history the, the way they want to do this. So I think gaps are very important and it gives a lot of uh, opportunities. And something again that I wanted to say is again that different bodies have different uh, urgencies and different relations to things. That's why I also think it's very important to leave these gaps or places for ambigu ambiguity <laughs> because things are so layered. And in our collection, so to say, we don't label things. So we do 
have an internal index where we write, okay, who donated this object, when, under which conditions, and what is the story behind. But we want to give the people the opportunity to relate to these objects without having this precondition, ah, it's this or this, defined, but understand and also go through this process by themselves. Like, how can I undo this if I have yeah. the urgency to do that? Which I think we invite people to have, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you keep the uncanny violence open. And this is the moment when I hand over to Irit uh, to introduce in the concept of the unarchivable that Uncanny we play. work on. <laughs> I, I suppose the, the sort of, of, I'm thinking about, you know, what Larry has put on the table, what you, Johan, have put on the table, what we're sort of preoccupied. And I'm thinking about two, two things that I seem to me to be important here. One is, um, the way in which archiving gestures, so not, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> not necessarily what's been archived, but the gesture of archiving, is um, simultaneously kind of undoing the categories of, of their own archiving. So the, the sort of, of archiving seems to me to, to be it's made up of the things, the objects, the images, the, the sort of, of um, the traces. And it's made up of the gestures of archiving. And it's in the sort of moments in which these undo themselves that I think we're, we're operating. And, <coughs> and the other thing which I think is important is that the unarchivable as a category is a kind of series of demands in the present. So they're not a it's not a series of historical demands. It's not about a kind of, of completing, kind of lacking historical moments. It's a series of demands in the present that kind of refuse contextualization. And, uh, you know, being, being sort of much shaped by the, the <coughs> by the thinking of Deleuze, the, the kind of refusal of context, the refusal of establishing a context which will explain everything, right? We rationalize everything, package it in some way. But this, this kind of notion that we replace context with encounter, where things kind of, of um, goad us. And that we are, in a way, with the unarchivable, um, engaging in genealogies of the contemporary, not historical kind of case studies. And so, in, in a way, in very different realms of experience that Lin Han and Larry have put forward, I think that my question is about melancholy. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, of, of thinking because I was talking to Bruno a few minutes before we started, and he was talking about sort of welfare melancholy, and it's kind of, of made me want to think melancholy. And um, about the fact that um, melancholy or kind of, of libidinal energies that animate Saidia Hartman's wonderful book, Wayward Lives, which I think is where our project kind of started, really. Um, that those are not capturable and that they nevertheless need to be kind of related to the material or the factual world, right? So it's that, it's again starting a project in attention in which something isn't capturable and shouldn't be capturable because it's much more potent when it's not captive, and at the same time has to be kind of related to material and factual entities around us, which are not contexts. It, it's, it's, it's slightly kind of, 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 of um, laborious what I'm trying to say, but I think th for me that's where the, the project starts in this contradiction, and that is irresolvable and yet those are the components. So it would be really nice to get Larry and uh, Lin Han 
sort of, of speaking to this. Should we start with Larry? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, my question. Yeah, my colleague. Um, I mean, I mean, one of the things obviously I'm aware of, with, like even describing or breaking down the other Willet Traveller project and this relationship with uh, various accounts that are kind of, you know, picked up through different points in time. Um, and again, you know, this, this, this relationship to, 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 to elements or things that cannot necessarily be archived. I think the, the point from which I, I really um, connect with from, from this conversation is, is actually through the tradition of, of the other griot, you know, um, a, a storyteller through um, various African uh, traditions across different nations and, and communities. Um, a person who, who brings forth and tells stories that are handed through to, to, to communities, but they're told, they're not, it's not like, you know, a, a, a physical kind of record in a way that, I don't know, the British Museum or, you know, these, these kinds of places uh, kind of entrap should I say, you know, objects and things, because they, they act almost like prisons. And even from my own personal experience of working with archives, with the likes of, you know, the British Museum, there's, there's a very, um, there's a melancholy there for sure. There's a sadness. I mean, I remember, I think going back to 2015 or 16, I did a, a sound-based residency where I had an interest to simply focus on the material of uh, various West African communities. And I remember the difficulty of being, of, of you know, I, I was allowed to listen to the material, but I was not allowed to use it because of all of these silly laws, these copyright laws. But then I thought, you know, and I looked at, you know, these, these different, um, what should we say, uh, uh, the names of the people who had recorded all of these, these things. Of course, people who are European, who, you know, they had the, the, the ownership of this material from various communities of the likes of Mali through to Nigeria through to you know Benin and so on it just just didn't make sense to me there's a certain certain kind of like anger if you will and 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 this kind of appropriation or stealing of of um of experiences and then and then this kind of like labeling or approaching to that um so you know how how I guess I respond to that through my own practice is through is through the practice of 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 or, or should I say the the heritage of the griot is 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 listening and, and and telling of of stories of handing those things down. You know, I speak to my children quite a lot about this. They probably don't even get it, but hopefully in years to come they do. But um, it, it it's something that almost without. Uh, the likes of my mother or my father at, at different points in time where they looked after me, I was able to find th this 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 aspect of 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 knowledge without without looking in into a certain thing like an encyclopedia. But but you know the 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 audible the oral history, you know, which is uh, very precious because of course that can be wiped out, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's what was kind of like coming, coming to mind for me. I'm not sure if that kind of is, or gives a, a an answer, if you will, but, but that's definitely, um, how, how I respond to that, that question. Yeah, I hope I don't go beyond, <laughs> but in time, but, uh, there's something absolutely beautiful about melancholy because more than melancholy, I would think of nostalgia because melancholy always for me has this kind of like sitting in inwards and like um, almost negative connotation. But this, it two things that come to my mind is a love because there's something worth to be commemorated in 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 a loving way, and one is the um, realm of uh, imaginative because you imagine something that is worth loving. And I think a place that is nourished by um, care and love is a place where you make less 
space for evil and hatred. And something um, that is very powerful to me is the realm of imagination, because we need imagination to also believe that the people in the future will look back and point the finger on us. And it's not colonialism being the grand evil, but us denying other people, other communities, the right of mobility. And we need to be held accountable for that. And we need imagination also to be able to relate to bodies that are displaced or to this subjectified thing that we want to capture in this very rigid format of an archive. And we had, because uh, before when you were talking, Irit, you were talking about geographies as well. And it uh, reminded me of a project that we had that was called Geographies of Imagination. So the very space of Savi was founded because Bonaventure, he was uh, already well connected in the art space, art world, and he wanted to uh, do shows. And art spaces mentioned, well, it's a nice concept, but you know, we do contemporary art and not African art. And then he thought, okay, he wrote this article saying how is it that the contemporary is being defined by nations and borders? And in this project, Geographies of Imagination, which was a research and exhibition project that uh, manifested itself as a cartographic timeline with different timelines as well, and performative as a performative process of unmapping the geographies of power and a space of created spaces of discourses and finding these forms to build connections between. And one artist who we invited, Anna Binta Diallo, a um, Canadian artist, she um, created this video with these collages imagining this long and forgotten past that she is connected to, which her ancestors are being from Senegal. And then the uh, sound and off was her clapping. So she imagined through the sound of her clapping that this vibration, the sound travels below the soil and connects her to this land that she wants to connect to. So yeah, there's a lot about melancholy, I think, in a very powerful, beautiful way because we ha heard soft power and I think it, it starts with us, right? That we find the courage and also motivation to relate to things. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, I mean, of course, I immediately in my head, I think uh, uh, about Freud and that I want to make the difference between melancholy and sadness and so on. But the way how you describe melancholy is in somehow is exactly the grief work. I think in, actually in both cases, which from, I mean, there might be, just thinking it with Freud, there might be a danger of fetishizing the, let's say, either the missing object or the gap or the violence or what, whatever. Mm, melancholy is some kind of fetishizing. And on the other hand, there is this, what I hear from the projects that you actually propose is this encounter, like this moment for the opening of a process of grievance that goes through the anger, that goes through also the endurance of the, of the almost, um, as you described it, yeah, it's almost, um, you feel that it's almost impossible to endure it, but yet it's there. Yeah? You want to say it's unbelievable, but yet it's obviously there, so obviously it happened. Um, which needs the space to, of an affective relation to it. And in this sense, um, again, in somehow it's, I mean, grievance in somehow is also encountering the struggle of the loss, encountering the struggle of the factual violence that happened and that made something with me. Um, as you said, in soft power, I mean, with Franz Fanon, we could say, you know, we, like, in best case, a struggle for independence. Um, if you win, you get rid of the colonizers, but what is with the colonizers in us? Yeah? What is when you get rid of the, um, of the violent, what is with the violence in you? What if you if you think that you get back an object from a museum? What is with the fact that the violence of making this object a commodity makes it only being given back as a commodity? What about that? 
And what you describe in what you say is, for me, this process of reappropriation, or we could say counter-appropriation, um, that actually needs to be done and needs to be worked through, which, which, which is, which I would describe in somehow also as a process of grievance that needs time and um, yeah. So in the, yeah, this this is how I would I would relate to that. I suppose I suppose the the kind of of issue for me is the difficulty of grasping the unarchivable as something which is both there and not there. And um, I, was, I was just thinking as, as, um, as Linhan was talking, I was thinking about the work of Jalal Tufik. And so Jalal Tufik is an Arab Iraqi theorist. And um, amongst his many books is a book in which he puts forward in relation to what he perceives of as the, the kind of, of tragedy of the Arab world in the last 30 years, he puts forward a, a differentiation. He talks about the difference between a disaster in which something existed, was destroyed, and at most what you have is access to the remnants of its destruction and between what he calls a surpassing disaster, in which within a disaster, something either was or wasn't destroyed, but what was destroyed was your ability to access it. And in a way, he's really talking about the Quran, the, the sort of, he's, he's talking about the, the sort of, of, the way in which the, the sort of meanings, the, the, the political and social meanings of the Quran have, have changed. But, I think in relation to what to everything that we've been talking about, uh, this notion of surpassing disaster is really interesting because it allows us to sort of of, of say we it it's a question of of, of the accesses, right? The the sort of, of one access towards a a series of events, a cataclysmic occurrence is to tie it down factually. This happened, this didn't happen, this remains, that doesn't remain, this is lost, and, and so on and so on. Through, through kind of, of, of traces. But another is through what he talks about, which is the blockage of the access to the very thing. That, that we're left with a desire, a recognition, and in an inability to access. And I think in my mind, the unarchivable is somehow linked to that, to, to the fact that it's not that I don't know it happened, I don't, or it existed, or it continues to exist, but the, the, the sort of, of a variety of forces, such as kind of, of neoliberal managerialism, have corrupted my ability to access it. Right? To, and by access it, I think we mean to make it work in the present. And it, that's what the genealogies of the contemporary are sort of about for me. So um, do, do we want to go straight into a discussion with the audience or the, do either of you want to sort of add anything to this? Um, Larry? Yeah, for some reason, yeah, I don't know. I'm not trying to curb or kind of making things logical here, but what was really interesting about what you kind of opened up there about the unarchivable there, it was it, it made me think about I guess the time that we're living in, which is, you know, it's, it's the digital realm, which um, is still in many respects, if we think about social media for example, is very much in its infancy. But I think what's quite peculiar about it, and I'm finding both professionally as well as personally, uh, both things being intertwined, I don't know separate them, especially as an artist, a practitioner, is um, this whole kind of, and, and I feel like it certainly is neoliberal kind of like driven that if, if something if something isn't presented or posted, then it doesn't exist. If you didn't play that sound or show that video, 
that thing. It can be anything mundane from, you know, having a meal right through to the, um, the, 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 the atrocities of, of, of police brutality towards black folk. You know, why do we need to see like a hundred videos or whatever to actually realize that this is true? Uh, why, why, why can't uh, somebody's uh, truth or story be heard without there having to be evidence of somebody actually dying in front of a, a camp, right? Um, and so there's this kind of, there's this, I, I feel like we're in this kind of almost flux state of, of confusion of, 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 with, 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 with an overload of, of information. And as a result, we, we, we become desensitized to that. Um, you know, but, but before, before kind of like posting online what someone would have uh, for dinner on, on Facebook or Instagram, you know, you might have a conversation about what you might, might be, you know, how does, you know, and, 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 and how that I think has also kind of um, created, not necessarily talking about melancholia, because I agree, I think melancholia is, is such a, a, a powerful word in, in, in speaking of, uh, in some respects, a state of wanting to sit within um, a, a space of, of nostalgia or to hold something. Um, I definitely feel like that at the end of the project. Um, but this, this process of, um, of needing to capture things all of the time, I, I have to say I was at this event, or I needed to say that I was at that, that place, or, you know, um, is is very interesting. I think for, for for this moment in in time that we that we live in, which then kind of overshadows itself with a tremendous sense uh, of of or space of, of of depression or a new era of, of depression, if you will. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Just it, it, it just really kind of like ignited uh, some thoughts. What you just said there. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything to kind of connect with that. Well, um, we, we thought that it's the moment to open it up um, for comments and additions and questions to both Larry and Lenhan and maybe to Nora and me, though. I think we've talked a lot. And um, the sort of, of see where we get to, right? It's, it's always see where we get to. So um, Julia is going to pick up the question. So okay. just a word of encouragement for anyone who has a question here in the audience or online. I'll be picking up the questions, passing on the mic. I also just wanted to comment for a minute and just wanted to say that we also need to be uh, mindful because I just thought, hey, nostalgia is also a very hostile wall that prevents things from happening because just because people are nostalgic for patriarchal uh, <laughs> systems, we are unable to also think in different ways. So I thought, hey, let's also not be romantic about nostalgia. Okay. Yeah. So you're retracting. <laughs> I can start with the first question if, well, the, well, the question warm up. Okay, sorry, Luis, afterwards. So I think we have, I mean, we get very clear what are the demands we pose onto the archival, no? I think you mentioned me read celebration, restoration, commemoration, but what would be then the demands we pose to the unarchivable, no? What is a lot? does it allow us to do? What types of permissions does it grant us? I'm trying to, I think like through the presentations, there were many hints, many also even concrete um, bits of evidence of that. But I would like to pose a question for, for a more collective elaboration of it. I think, you know, that's, that's an enormous question. And I, I don't think we're in a position yet to sort of say, but there's there's something I kind of you know said over and over and over and over again as a teacher that we only know how to know what we already know, right? That, and this is absolutely fundamental. Our capacity for knowing what we don't know is very very small. 
So the, the sort of, for me, the unarchivable goes in that direction. It's the beginning of creating a certain kind of multiple apparatus for engagement with that which we don't yet know, which uh, hasn't come with a set of tools for its knowing, mm -hmm. whose implications are not clear to us. And, or that is tugging along, like in what Larry was talking about in terms of the pandemic, the, the sort of just depth of ignorance and inequality around the medical system that we recognized in Britain throughout the pandemic is, is something that it's incalculable, right? It, it can't be put into any boxes because it starts opening more and more and more questions about medicine itself, mm -hmm. you know, about, about sort of, of, because elision, you know, it, it can't be put down to racism or, you know, op oppression. Elision is such a complex process of all the different disciplines and bodies of knowledge and institutions that sort of produce this condition of elision. And for me, those are the realms of the unarchivable that not to, not to redress, you know, not, not, not to undo the elision, but to kind of understand the processes by which knowledges are visible or invisible or agitating. That, that I think the thing about the unarchivable for Nora and I was always it's in there and it's making endless amounts of incomprehensible noise, right? And we've got to figure out how to listen to it. Would that be accurate? Yeah, maybe later I can add okay. things, maybe people have many questions. But yeah, I feel very, I feel very late. Hi there, I've got a question for Larry. Hi Larry, I'm, I'm Lewis. How are you doing? Um, you, I want to ask you if you can maybe say a little bit more about something you talked about earlier in your presentation. Um, you mentioned I think the insufficiency of the term Afrofuturism uh, in relation to your work, the themes of your work, and w what's animating um, your work. I'm not so interested in what you think about the term Afrofuturism here necessarily, but about um, the insufficiency of certain terms which are used to kind of structure and archive um, the cultures of black radicalism, black consciousness, politics and music. So I'm just wondering, how do you deal with certain problems, which are quite practical problems for you as an artist, when um, your work is being presented and you know there's this kind of metadata tagging that goes with it, that, that, that enters your work into an archive under, say, Afrofuturism, and you say, well, that's neutralizing something. Right? So I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that in relation to what you were getting at earlier about this term. Um, Larry, can you hear it now? <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Um, great question. Um, I was going to say, what, one of the things that, that inspired this um, this desire to, to, to create um, and, and, and build terminology, you know, words, uh, memes from my own terms actually, was, was coming across um, an interview by the writer, uh, Nnedi Okorafor, who, um, who, who's, who's written a, a, a tremendous amount of, of, of novels that uh, relate um, aspects of science fiction with, with different um, African heritages and, and, and traditions and so on. And, and I remember uh, kind of like essentially in, in different interviews or, or posts rejecting the, the, the term Afrofuturism for her. It, it, similarly to myself, it wasn't, it, it, she, she wasn't saying, oh, well, you know, like 
throw away everything that, you know, they, for, for, for some people they, they feel their work is connected to, but it just didn't connect for her. Um, and one of the things that I took from what she was saying was that uh, those of us as, um, as Africans, uh, both born on the continent, the diaspora and so on, um, it's important for us to create our own terms. Um, our, our own terms for, 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 for speaking, for existing. Um, it's just not enough to use the terms that already exist or the ones that have been used to contain us. Um, and, and for me, there's nothing more beautiful than being an artist and, and, and being able to do that. You know, um, I think sometimes there's a fear to kind of challenge that because if you do, then you're saying that, oh, well, this is entirely wrong and what it is that I'm saying is right. But, um, you know, you think about words like feminism, you know, made by, you know, white um, French middle upper class man. You know, like, what does, what does he have in relation to the connection of the, the relationship of the experiences of a black woman? Um, for me, it's, it's, it's really about those that, those that are misrepresented and, 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 and where that agency is, needs to be given back. Um, and, th and that's what I try to do with my work. I don't try to say, oh, you know, something that you know, all other folk or whatever who I'm talking to or talking about need to subscribe to that. But it's just not acceptable for me personally to just accept that which exists or the status quo, as it were, um, that I think has a relationship with what was being said earlier about um, about nostalgia actually, which can be um, quite disastrous. You know, one of the funny things with even like the whole Brexit thing, I remember with the campaigns when, you know, like being in, in, in London or traveling across the UK when I was working on projects is, you know, uh, people, locals from different places talking about, you know, the good old days. And it's like, what good old days and, and, and who are they for? And, and, and on what terms are we talking, right? So. Yeah, I don't know if that kind of went off into a whirlwind, but I hope that answered your question or reached in towards answering that. Actually, I want to ask you, Lewis, in, in just in relation to that, um, in, the, in the sort of last decade, a certain kind of coziness has crept into the term Afrofuturism. It's become a kind of convenience, right? The, the sort of... of you, you you take oppressions and you kind of, of structure them in terms of possibilities. And it's be, it's become cozy. And I was wondering why you brought it up. Um, well, well, it's just because um, Larry raised it. Um, I don't have a problem with the term. Uh, Afrofuturism, and so it's not that I want to develop something around this term. I think it's more about this question about um, archiving and therefore um, what is unarchivable are the are the um, the processes which shape the selection criteria, and that's quite well understood, and that's you know the the bread and butter of post structuralist theory and you know, reading some of the people who are in the kind of citations for um, the kind of theorization of the archive and the unarchivable. But there's just, there's something else to this, which it's, it's not so much a coziness. It's, it's more about, I think, what um, Lenan was talking about earlier in relation to nostalgia. But I wasn't really thinking, when you were talking about a kind of, there's a dampening of force. Right, or, or, the, um, or nostalgia can kind of precipitate a kind of quieting of uh, resistance in favor maybe of reaction, right? And, and a, an experience I had recently going to an exhibition, which is just absentmindedly going to um, the Turner Room at Tate Britain. And it wasn't a, a consciousness changing experience of an exhibition. It was more like a moment of surprise though whereby um, there was a vitrine in that exhibition 
and Larry, you're shaking your head there, so you may know what I'm, I'm getting at with this. But there was a, there was a vitrine of a collection of um, Detroit techno records and, um, and a magazine, Wire magazine, with, a, with an article by Kojo Ashen on Drexia. Um, it, it wasn't so much the coziness, but it was the way in which that vitrine, right, of that material, of this Detroit techno music, which has become now used as a kind of a shorthand and a cliche to talk about this is how black electronic music um, manifests the consciousness of um, the middle passage and resistance to it. It's become a kind of a, 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 a there's a kind of a trinification of it. There's a crystallization of that that's been, that, that the museum can use in order to demonstrate its responsiveness to the present. But it seems to me what's unarchivable about that process is just by putting it in a vitrine, it f dampens the force of that music and of a black consciousness of resistance and rebellion, which is highly active. Um, and so it, it's not so much the coziness of Afrofuturism or Afrofuturism as an operative term, I think, is a problem. It's just the way in which certain criteria are used in order to select um, black music in, 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 to prov in providing a kind of a place in the institution, in the museum, and then that's used then in order to silence everything else. You know, in a way, I, 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 don't, think, I don't find there a difference between like, you know, that or the way that museums hold, you know, um, important objects uh, to, to various, you know, indigenous communities. There's definitely a relationship with the way that, um, you know, grime music, which was developed literally right by my next, you know, next door to where I grew up in, in, in uh, Bethnal Green, in Bow, right? Like, um, it always has to be on the terms of that of the, of the institution as to how the game is played or how, you know, this, this enters the, the, the realm of, of being, you know, valid enough to, 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 to have a conversation about. Um, I also find it kind of weird and funny in a way how, you know, institutions or galleries even, they, they cozy up with, with, with black culture in order to utilize um, the specialness of those things that are created, but then you know, anything else that comes with that, it just gets dashed to the side. Um, and that's, you know, that's definitely happening with, with, with grime music at the moment. It's, um, yeah, I don't know, I don't even have the words for it, but, you know, you see it and you feel it. And I think that's also for me why, even as a practitioner, that what whilst I said earlier, you know, yeah, sure, I do create work that, you know, kind of, ends up being in an exhibition space. I'm also interested in, 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 in the freedom beyond that because the, the gallery space doesn't simply just contain the ideas. It can imprison them, actually. And, you know, this aspect of oppression and then also this, uh, this behaviour which excludes people, um, you know, it, 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 it continues. But that's quite a complex one. I think that, you know, obviously a much larger conversation at another moment perhaps is needed for that. But yeah, I appreciate what you what you pointed out there. Hi, thank you for that. Um, it's great that you're going to ask something because I was going to actually point to you and say. I, I, was, I was afraid of that, so I thought to pre okay. preempt you. Um, <laughs> Irit, you were talking earlier on about, um, you were referencing Said when he was paraphrasing Said, talking about the cartography as a colonial project, a view from everywhere and from uh, nowhere. And I was wondering for you and Nora developing this project, how that same term or that same definition uh, applies to the notion of the archive. And while listening to you, I was kind of playing in my head with changed titles like anecdoted ecologies of exhibition lives, anecdoted roots of exhibition lives, anecdoted knowledges of exhibition lives following Bona's contribution, 
anecdotal memories of exhibitions li exhibition lives or an anecdotal base of exhibition lives, referencing the base, the buck, where we are now. And what these terms enable differently in terms of how we relate to knowledge, objects, symbols, um, points of reference. And for Linhan, I was, I was wondering a little bit the same. You were, you were talking about the archive as much as you were speaking about collective memory or the act of creating collective memory. Is there a conflict between the kind of notion of capture that seems to be inherent to the term archive, but you were also talking about the vulnerable archive, if I didn't uh, misunderstand. Uh, and maybe in the context where you are operating now, where a party like the alternative, a fascist party like the alternative for Deutschland is literally running what they call public um, exhibition, uh, sorry, public poster exhibitions showcasing orientalist paintings in and reducing uh, national memory and national history to this, uh, to the glorification of, uh, of, of colonialism. That, does that make it even more important to talk about archive as a site of struggle? And lastly for uh, Larry, when you were talking about Senko time and the notion of retrieval, I had the feeling that there's a kind of paradoxical retrieval because it's as much about living memory or about the construction of a future memory as it is about uh, the past. Thank you for the question. I mean, for, I mean, what I've written down was capture <laughs> and archive. I think there's something beautiful in not being able to capture something. So this collective mapping that we're trying to do with this very fragmented um, accumulation of stories, how people relate to things, is what it is. It's fragmented. And I think it's... Um, there's also beauty in destruction because I think uh, not everything is meant to last. And if it was for me, I would just, in a performative act, get rid of half of the objects that we have and release the ghosts that haunt us. But it's not f for me to do so because it's not my, my archive. It's an archive for the people and also from the people. And I think the moment where you try to capture something and um, have this very presumptuous attempt to present a counter archive, you're already failing because I think this is an ever, ever, ever uh, lasting journey to try and fail and try and fail and try and fail and try to find counter ways of this um, containers. You know, I think there's no problem with something that is unarchivable, but we need to rethink the containers that contain these toxic things, and we need to um, be open to find different forms. And, and there's, so if I would uh, answer your question, I would say we don't want to capture things because we don't want to be stuck in this momentum of, oh, okay, that's the way. Because if you think of the example, I mean, it's a bit far-fetched, of these two Buddha statues in Afghanistan that were built, you know, one generation after the other, after the other. So the first generation that built maybe the feet or just imagined how it's in there, they did never see the statue. And I'm thinking, how can we have this very open conversation of how can we do some substantial baby steps in enabling counter-thinking, counter-memories, because we won't be able to, I don't think that I'll be able to see it, you know, in my lifetime, Th which doesn't mean that we shouldn't work hard in enabling the first steps, if this is answering your question. And in regards to this uh, poster campaign, I wanted to say something that's much more present in failing to um, give this narrative that encompasses the colonial gaze is the Humboldt Forum, because I think the Humboldt Forum is very successful in negating um, their <coughs> responsibility that they need to be held accountable for, for the things that they hold captured in this beautiful um, recreation of a castle that they made. So I think this is uh, much more pressing because it has prestige, it has money, where money is, there's power. Yeah, that's how I would relate. 
in, in relation to what you were saying about you know the names, the titles, the the, I I think anecdote archive was an effort to engage with the processual, right? So the the sort of, of if if you think about any kind of conventional way of thinking about exhibitions, it's always from the final product, um, and any form of narrative of viewing them is always from a final judgment. And I, I think that one of the things we really wanted to get at, because we talk endlessly about, you know, kind of substituting processes for objects and, and how important that is and how it much better reflects the, the, the kind of, of um, the sort of, of, of practices around us. But I, I think that that's a sort of, on the whole, fairly unanswered demand, the demand for actually focusing on process. And what we wanted was to get away from the, the sort of, the way in which something circulates in the world, which is the year it was made, the place it was shown, what it contained, you know, what its thematic was who curated it, and then in other realms, how many people came to it, and um, what the critics had to say about it. And the sort of, of how do you get at real notions of process? Well, I think for us, it was if we, if we fragment the making and we fragment the viewing, then we begin to have you know, contours, elements of process. And that's why, you know, anecdotal lives really kind of, of ongoing, unstable references that can be, cannot be validated by facts was um, something sort of, of, of quite central. I'll pass on to Larry to the, the um, question. Can you, sorry, there were, there were so many questions Larry. in there. The, the, um, I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Um, I forget what to ask the question. I think I got it, but I just want to make sure. I was asking a general question of how the different uh, contributors relate to the notion of archive and the element of capture that is inherent to the concept of archive following Said's uh, or Irit's paraphrasing of Said on cartography and colonial cartography. In your case, I asked, whether um, that I had the feeling that your work and your proposition of Sanko time and the notion of retrieval had less to do with archiving and more with building on living memory or constructing future memory. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, most certainly. I mean, I, you know, from what I, I highlighted earlier about the, uh, the griot and the, the, the importance of, of, of the griot's place in, in, in the, 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 the telling and the handing of of, of stories, um, I think this becomes particularly, you know, poignant and, and, and important. And yeah, the you know the you know one could argue in that sense that maybe you know the body perhaps like becomes a uh, an archive or a holder of, of, of information that of course is, is is passed on. If I even think about the way that you know the, I, I'm a parent, for example, I have experiences that. Um, where there are interconnecting similarities with things that, that my children are experiencing, but then there, of course there are differences by which, you know, they, they, they hopefully are able to make, you know, the, uh, differing decisions, you know, from that. Um, the, the, the importance, of course, with, with Sanko time being about looking at what was seen, but looking deeper into what, what had been, what has been, been passed by. Um, and that can be as simple as, you know, uh, an object that's in front of someone right through to um, a, a message that can't quite represent or manifest itself in the way that it needs to in, in, in a point of time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, 
you know, that, that it, it features through, for me, the, the, the practice in, in a myriad of ways. It, it, it's not just through the video work, it's through the sound, it's through, it's through everything I do. And, and yeah, I, in, in some respects, I would, I would consider those, um, those, those strands of, of delivery that align themselves with that of, of, of a grill, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Can I also can I also try to answer? <laughs> no, it's it's good. I think it's beautiful. After that, um, actually, yeah. So I think the uh, I mean the way how I relate to Marx's uh, idea that history is a history of struggle is that I would say that we are all deeply haunted by the struggles of history, by so many different ones that move us in so many different ways. And this means, and this also means for me the right to history, means the right to relate with each other to these histories of struggles and violence that also, that also make our present, to, to share it, to understand it, to understand it together in order to see what's actually going on and in order to imagine other possible futures. So this is, for me, the right to history is extremely important. To leave the idea of the archive behind is, for me, part of, uh, of the violence of neoliberalism, actually, and to turn it into so many different ways of being together that would in somehow render history either a commodity or not that important. This is why I would say that um, also, and Exhibitions for me are also part of this right to history. So now a history of exhibitions seems important for me, but not in the way how it is usually done. And this is exactly why there was this disappointment that Irit and I shared, why we thought, how could we work on a different way to relate to the history of exhibitions? Now, I have to say that saying all this means to understand that there, on the one hand, there is an emancipatory dimension in the relation to history, but it's never coming without the moment of capturing. So, I mean, it's maybe a Benjamin truism, you know, but history is always embedded in power. But another truism of Foucault, where it's power, there is resistance. And these two truisms are true for the archive as well, which means that um, whatever is captured also has the resonance of the violence of the capturing in it. And this resonance, of course, just as the struggle, cannot be captured. You cannot just say, okay, now we have this, 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 this demands, wonderful, let's just get the struggle now. It won't happen. I mean, of course, you can put um, Afrofuturism or Detroit music in a vitrine, but you will just, I mean, you. And somehow you can capture it. Of course, may, as you can, I mean, you make borders and many people die, and this is deeply violent. But you will never create a situation where nobody comes. And this is exactly the same where nobody enters, you know? Many people die at the borders, but nevertheless, many people enter. You can, there is no, no border will create a clean situation. You cannot clean. You can, you can have an imagination of a cleaning, capturing, but it's not happening. And just in the same way, the resistance is kept in the archive. It's there, but it's not archivable. It's there without being archivable. It's there through the gaps, but also through the through rem remainders. It's there. And, and this is my point. My point is, that actually the an emancipatory or a radical democratic, or I would say actually the only reason why we would relate to the archive is this unarchivable. And this is actually the, this is actually, let's say, the ethics of the archival practice. This is what, what is to be worked for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Jonas, in a way, I, I kind of turn the mirror back to you because by complete chance on Tuesday, I was um, teaching something on world making, and I showed your initial parliament, the the um, the one that was in Berlin, and talked about the the sort of, of turning to not leaders of resistance movements and national liberation movements that have been 
termed terrorists and kind of designated no-fly risks, but to their legal representatives, which for me is exactly a kind of constellation of the unarchivable, because they're not the direct relations to the deeds or the, to the, the kind of, of um, to the, the, the political categories which are termed terroristic. There, and yet, there is a kind of oblique way of referencing them and getting to them. And I, I think that, for me, operates, you know, as a kind of mode of the, of the unarchivable. Perhaps not to you. Just to follow up on uh, Nora's comments. Um, so it seems that the focus is much more the unarchivable, and I'm very happy that actually these questions kind of clarified it even more, that it's not really what is sidelined or not seen yet or uh, rejected or misplaced. It's rather what exists but has not been phrased, contoured, uh, discovered or seen, maybe. Um, but through a personal experience of mine with an exhibition as a curator, I wanted to bring in also the question of what about when you do have the archive that is capturing the unarchivable, uh, which we see in many cases, specifically when it comes to archives that belong to social anthropology or sociology, etc. Um, and there is just no interest for this type of archive. I mean, many of the archives, you know, I, we're, we're talking all this time about this binary of the good archive and the bad archive, or the one that has resistance and power, which is usually patriarchal and, and racist. But what about the archive that is somehow neutral and almost boringly dying? Um, and I just wanted to give this example because when we did an exhibition with Sanya Ivegovic some years ago at State of Concept in Athens, our whole process was actually visiting these archives where all these histories of, of uh, partisan women were just basically dying in boxes because no one was interested. So I, I just wanted your thoughts a little bit on that. On I just, just two things. So one thing is, um, actually, I don't think that the unarchivable is capturable. The unarchivable is uncapturable. Yeah? So you cannot capture the unarchivable. What you, as soon as you capture it, you make it archivable. The only thing that you can do with the unarchivable is actualize the conflict, is connect with it, is relate to it, is hear it in somehow. But as soon as you capture it, I mean, it might become gold, but it's definitely not the unarchivable anymore. And the other thing is about this existence. So I, I see it, I see this unarchivable, um, I mean, it's also monstrous, it's terrible. We talked about um, melancholy, it's also violence, it's also, it's, um, it's also desire. Um, I see it more as the real in Lacan. So I would say it, well, it's more insisting than existing. So to imagine it more as the insistence of the archive, that, um, that the archival practices with so many different strategies and tactics try to silence, 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 silence. And then when you just remove, when you find ways, you know, to remove some of the tactics, it starts to scream out of it, you know. And, um, and in this sense, I would say, I mean, there are many reasons why the anti-fascist struggle could start to scream. And many reasons why it doesn't, why it doesn't in this, especially in this post-Yugoslavian, um, um, yeah, um, o almost fascist or fascist situations. I think we need to close now, but thank you very, very much, everyone. Everyone in the audience, especially Larry, Irid, Nora and Lin Han for your engagement. I think also all the topics that we've treated are of slow digestion, so I would invite everyone here to actually continue the conversation um, with a drink outside. And also thank you very much for everyone following us online. And I'd like to thank everyone for thinking with us. 
because uh, as you can see, this is a work in progress. We have only questions, no answers, and much need of um, a kind of invitation of additional thought to our own. So thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. I want to add two comments to it. Um, besides the fact this is just a beginning, I, I think it was extraordinary uh, session, a beginning of the of the of a long uh, process. But I wanted to add two things to the to the mix. When you were talking a little about exhibitions and how we look at the exhibitions, how we archive exhibitions, I would want to um, add uh, a project to our conversations and that, that's an exhibition as a series of trainings for being together otherwise, called Trainings for the Nordia that we did with, uh, with the artist Jeanne van Heiswijk, which I think escapes just about every, every definition of exhibition we, we performed this afternoon. And I, I hope you grab a book. Louise, I'm, I'm uh, borrowing your private copy for, for this, which is called Toward the Nordia Artists' uh, Public Practice, which pivots uh, around this uh, this particular uh, project. It's on sale from tomorrow on, so um, yeah, I don't know how. Um, but still, next session within this series, speaking of, you know, we are just at the beginning, is on 13th and 14th of November at this space, Music as Spectral Infrastructure, which is devised by, by Luis Moreno for Free Thought Collective, as part of Le Guess Who Festival uh, here in the city of Utrecht. And I just want to uh, warmly invite uh, everybody. It's going to be just amazing. Thank you. I'm asking really in, on behalf of Larry. The, the, the Spectral Infrastructure, the music festival, I guess, who, will that be streamed or recorded in some way? Yeah, both during the day. Okay. The DJ Fantastic. sets at, not, at night, we won't be scre uh, screaming, <laughs> screening nor recording, but indeed the discursive and listening sessions we will. Yes, very welcome, Larry. Amazing. And Thank everybody you. else. Thank you. Thanks for asking that. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. And there are drinks. Thank you. Thank you.